Hello, I'm here with Kansas House Representative Mike Dodson, who is running for re-election this campaign season. How are you doing today, doing Mike? fine. Thank you. Good to be with you. Well, we are so happy that you are here. And a lot of our viewers, they are first-time voters, and there's still time for them to get out there and vote. As the incumbent for the Kansas House of Representatives, what are some issues that you are passionate about and that you believe students should care about to go and vote for? Yeah. First of all, I just encourage everyone to do what you said. I, I think the voting is one of our fundamental rights, and uh, you know, if we don't vote, we don't have many people to blame for inattention. I would say we've got several things to do. This is the kind of thing I talk to people about when I go to the door. This is how do we bring everybody together? How do we have a discussion that enables us to reach some kind of a, an agreed solution Maybe not pleasing to everyone, but certainly we can do that with a dialogue that doesn't offend people and drive them away from side to side. The other one I've worked on for quite some time is economic development. My basic theory is if we can bring in economic development to Kansas, this allows us to uh, have revenue then that can be expended year to year to bring down our own taxes. And taxes, as everyone knows, are pretty high. Property taxes are probably the, one of the highest things on people's minds. Uh, it just seems to go up every year. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One is uh, tax valuation, and then one is the mill rate that you put on those evaluations. So when we, even when we hold the mill rate steady, the evaluations drive up the amount of taxes that people have to pay. So in, in uh, Riley County, we pay uh, tax to the county, tax to the city, ta tax to the USD 383. And then uh, inside the city, we pay 80% of the operational costs for the RCPD as well as pay for the library. So what would seem like kind of a 50-50-50 split, 55 mills each, then turns out to only yield about 25 to 30 mills for the city. So that's that's another one. And I think uh, the one that uh, a lot of people are thinking about these days is Medicaid. You know, we have lost arguably since uh, 2014 $650 million a year. And our hospitals, a lot of people don't understand this, uh, also support some of our clinics that are scattered throughout maybe 50 to 100 mile radius depending on uh, where you're located. And I'd say Manhattan is one of those hubs that supports a lot of other communities. So that $600 million a year spread across the state would really do great things for us and keep uh, our hospital going. I think we've lost 76 either failed or uh, failing clinics. And that's a big deal for rural Kansas. Right. So we've got to reverse that. Right, and that would ask me, actually lead me to my next question is, uh, what do you believe, do you believe in the expansion of can care? Why or why not? Well, it's uh, can care, you know, we, we probably can take our choice between can care and Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid uh, has been adopted by 38 other states. We ought to be able to learn a lesson from that since 2014. So, in other words, if other states have made a mistake, we ought to be able to capitalize on those mistakes. And then, None, none of those 38 have rescinded opting in. So that's another good sign. So I think this, uh, the, the whole health system could be helped by bringing in Medicaid, which could then uh, benefit CanCare. And, but CanCare is a little slim as well, so. Okay. So Kansas State University has seen a decrease in enrollment over the past few years. Why do you think this has been happening, and can Kansas State or can Kansas House representatives do anything to turn these numbers around? Well, there's a few things that have been done, but let me address kind of what I think the basic issue is first. Uh, you know, we went into the pandemic, and that was part of the cause. In other words, some people wanted to sit out, some people were not comfortable. Uh, the other one is cost. When moms and dads uh, look at cost options and they look at Kansas State University versus maybe Hayes State or something, maybe they choose to um, go to school for two years at Hayes and then come to Kansas State with their transferred credits. So there's a lot of dynamics. The other one is the demographics. The demographics for kids is going down. Some other kids are choosing not 
to go to college. Maybe they go to a technical school or maybe they just do something else right out of high school. And here in Manhattan, we have MATC in partner with a high school and they've created a campus that basically trains people early to get right into the workforce and they stay here. So that's a good thing. So one of the things we've talked to both KSU and the foundation was about is how do we attract people back? How do we get them going back to college and specifically KSU? I think President Linton has it right. Uh, just like John Weefold before him, uh, you have to go across the state. This is a land grant institution, supports all the kids in the state, and by going to all those uh, cities across the state, you can then engender some activity and some interest in coming to Kansas State University. The other one is facility improvement. And I think uh, some time ago you had a, uh, a, a story on about $380 million worth of maintenance that had to be done. So the planning has to include new buildings that might uh, also include the tearing down of some old and the modernization of some. So I think things like uh, the grain science building, I mean agriculture is at the heart of what we do, and a grain science building much in the same way that the business center has attracted a lot of people just because it's a great learning environment like our library, uh, that will bring people back. They have to see something uh, that lures them in. Once they're here, obviously they're captured because they love it. What do you feel is the top issue in Manhattan, Kansas that if reelected you plan to improve upon? Well, I think, uh, like I said, I think it's economic environment. Uh, we've done some things up in the, in the, the legislature to uh, provide uh, stipends, to provide um, scholarship money, to provide uh, if you send somebody to school as an employer, you get a rebate for that. We've done some uh, things like create the ability to build spaces over businesses for housing and also some rural housing development like you might look south of Points Avenue to see that. So when you look at the, wha what we need to do in Manhattan, economic development, probably the one that hardly anybody talks about is childcare. How do we make it possible for the conditions we're in, which being that almost every mom is working because they need two incomes, how do we make it possible for them to be able to send their child to a safe and secure and a learning environment, at the same time provide some kind of an economic incentive to somebody to start childcare? And then I mentioned housing. Some time ago, we set aside part of that uh, sales tax revenue for uh, workforce housing. It's not very much, but it's a start. So I'd say when you look at all of this, you would say, well, how do we make sure that uh, Manhattan grows? Have to have workforce, have to have new business, have to have a learning environment like we have at KSU and MATC in the high school, and then you have to have the ability to facilitate. So you have to have housing and you have to have childcare. There's so much contention about election integrity across the country right now. What are your thoughts on this? And should you not win re-election, how, how are you preparing to accept the results? Well, I've never had those kind of questions about the elections. I mean, if, if people would read history, they would know that our elections today are far more secure than they ever have been in the past. It's just that a lot more people are on uh, social media and you know if they find a thread they find one instance of something all of a sudden it's a huge deal and it's manifested across the country i was on the elections committee and there were a lot of uh, initiatives raised to do things to quote make elections more secure but at the same time you want to secure your elections you want to make sure that people have a reasonable chance to vote so uh, I think one of the things we did is make sure that people can't harvest votes. In other words, you can't go from uh, house to house and solicit and say, I'll pick up all your ballots. That's not allowed. And then uh, none of those ballot machines, the voting machines are connected to the internet. That's a requirement by the federal government and Secretary Schwab has uh, verified all of those for each one of the 
counties. So as you know, Governor Kelly has eliminated the food tax. Do you think this is good for the people of Kansas and is it enough to eliminate the burden of Im inflation? Uh, well, no, it's not enough to eliminate inflation because inflation is a lot more than food. Uh, my own prediction was that inflation would begin to mitigate uh, sooner than this, but obviously it's global inflation. So people that make things to send here and can't send them drive up demand. So that means places like China who are locked down all the time can't do it. Uh, the food tax will cost us about $460 million in revenue when it's applied to everyone. That's in either two or three years. Uh, my preference would have been to allow a food tax that is only applicable to those in certain earning categories. I don't mind paying tax because I have enough money to pay tax, but the people who don't are burdened ever more by having to pay that food tax. Food is one of those things you have to have, obviously. So, uh, yeah, I voted for the food tax. And on the... Uh, Legislative side, uh, uh, Governor Kelly had said go to zero now. On the legislative side, we said go to zero. We went one third this year, and then we have the option of going to zero next year. Water policy is a new issue that many voters might not be thinking about, but is becoming more prevalent in rural communities. How do you plan to um, protect rural farmers and their water resources? Yeah, uh, Ron Hyland, you know, who's uh, out past Wamego. Uh, Kenny Titus is going to be the new representative out there. Ron was placed on the water committee, and this committee was formed just for that reason. Uh, so we've got issues with the aquifers in the west that are dropping. We've got issues in how we apply water, that is, are we doing it in a metered way, or are we just spraying it where it causes a lot to evaporate? Uh, what about water quality inside some of our cities? And one of the phenomena that we've noticed is as the federal government or even the state has tightened the requirements, then what you get are ever more costly water systems. Now, a city like Manhattan can handle that. But if you're a little town, you have to have federal assistance. Like if certain levels get too high, there has to be machinery, filters and pumps and so on, to take care of that. So that's an issue. Upstream water rights are an issue. Uh, my daughter just moved from Wichita to Arizona and watching those two big reservoirs dry up, uh, I haven't visited them for about eight years, but I know how they used to be. And uh, so there's a severe problem. All right, could you tell our student voters one fun fact about you and then why they should go out and vote, whether it be for you or any other candidate? Yeah, uh, I don't have too many fun facts. I was in the Army for 37 years, and some might know that, uh, some might not. After uh, I went in the Army and retired, then I went to work for Bechtel Corporation, which is the largest privately held construction company in America and got to do a lot of the things that I'd wanted to do in the Army, which is when I start building something, I'd like to see it actually finished. So that was very gratifying to me. And then obviously the city commission and being the mayor and, and then uh, being fortunate enough to go up and sit in a house seat was, was terrific. But uh, as we said in the beginning, I, I think that everybody has to have this understanding of the people that have come before and have worked so hard to make sure that the nation is preserved, if you don't vote, even if you don't like some of the candidates, do your research, real research, you know, not just kind of online stuff, and then go down and cast your vote, and then you have a right to uh, complain if something goes wrong, or you should be proud anyway that you're just a voter. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Mike Dodson, and good luck well. tonight. There is still time to go out and vote. The polls will be closing at 7 p.m. Please follow the Collegian for more news coverage over election night 2022. From the Collegian Newsroom, I'm Gwyneth Davidson.